Hi, everyone. Good to see you again. I'm Anne Marie Green. And I'm Vladimir Gigiep. It is, you know what? What? <laughs> Could it be election day? <laughs> it is election day in New Hampshire, where voting is underway in the 2020 Democratic primary, in case you hadn't noticed. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Senator Bernie Sanders leads in our latest battleground tracker, while Mayor Pete Buttigieg follows closely behind. Candidates rallied supporters yesterday, making a last-ditch efforts to win over New Hampshire's undecided voters and taking on President Trump was the main focus. CBS News political reporter Caitlin Huey Burns has been following it all uh, from Manchester, New Hampshire, where the voting is in full swing. Actually, it looks a little empty there. I know, I was going to say full swing. Like, pivot, pivot that <laughs> camera a little bit. I know there's some swinging voters over there. Uh, <laughs> Caitlin, uh, polls are, uh, how are things looking out there? Well, good morning from McDonough Elementary School here in Manchester, New Hampshire. Voters across the state will be filing into gymnasiums and auditoriums like this one to cast their ballots in the New Hampshire primary. A lot of those voters will be making up their minds at the last minute. But if we've learned anything from reporting on the ground here over the past few days, New Hampshire wants to send a clear message. Unlike Iowa, they will deliver results. The knives are out in New Hampshire. Oh, come on, man. You think this guy's not a Barack Obama? Pete has raised campaign contributions from over 40 billionaires. The idea that you've either got to be for a revolution or you got to be for the status quo leaves most of us out. After the chaos surrounding last week's caucuses. In Iowa, as all of you know, when they finally got around eight months later to count the votes. Democrats are aiming to put Iowa in the rearview mirror. Voter turnout in Iowa was lower than expected. Does that suggest any kind of lack of enthusiasm in the Democratic Party right now? I don't think we should be drawing a lot of conclusions from Iowa. And they are hoping the Granite State can play a more decisive role in picking the president. It's not a caucus, it's a regular primary, so it'll be fine. While New Hampshire could offer a fresh start after Iowa, the CBS News battleground tracker shows the same two candidates, Pete Buttigieg and Bernie Sanders, leading the pack. Yet only 39% of voters here say they have definitely made up their minds. I swear, it, I, I feel like a, a, a compass just going in circles. That uncertainty has candidates pitching their cases until the very end. I'm asking you to vote for me, but I'm also asking you to do more in the next two days, to talk to your friends, that really classic New Hampshire way. I've been back and forth to this day a lot. In the past, New Hampshire has offered mixed results, at times fertile ground for underdogs. New Hampshire tonight has made Bill Clinton the comeback kid. And at other times, a spoiler. We have made history again tonight, my friends, here in New Hampshire. This time around, voters appear to be thinking more like strategists. Thinking a little bit about where they stand now and where they might be able to go after New Hampshire uh, is going to be a big factor. Well, polls close here at 7 p.m., and that means the candidates are still out there campaigning, visiting polling locations like these across the state. They know that New Hampshire is going to be critical for determining the nominee, and they're have, uh, hoping to convert every last one of those many undecided voters here. So, Caitlin, you mentioned that uh, Bernie Sanders and Pete Buttigieg, they've really led the public polls there in New Hampshire. What is it about these two candidates? You know, why does it seem like they like them in New Hampshire? Do they think that they're the ones to beat President Trump? Or does it have more to do with their policies? Well, Bernie Sanders and Pete Buttigieg represent really two different visions for the Democratic Party, and that's kind of been at the heart of this Democratic primary process. When you look at Bernie Sanders, he did really well here in New Hampshire, overwhelmingly won the primary in 2016. Uh, that really boosted his campaign moving forward. He still enjoys strong support. When you look at the CBS News battleground tracker, it shows that his voters are the most enthusiastic of the bunch. Then you look at someone like Pete Buttigieg, who is hoping 
to capitalize on a New Hampshire tradition of picking underdogs, of picking people who may not be the, the, the original candidate that Democrats thought that they might want. Uh, so that's kind of what he's hoping for. And he's really trying to aim at those nearly 40 percent of voters here who aren't affiliated with a party and they're more independent. They can uh, come here and primary uh, participate in the primary for Democrats or Republicans. And so that's what he has been really focused on, converting those voters to uh, to his way. But this is also a place where uh, there could be surprises. A lot of people here have been saying that they're interested in Amy Klobuchar. We've seen her surge in the polls in recent days after a good per debate performance here the other night. And uh, people that we've been talking to on the ground say, don't count her out. Hmm. Uh, so, Caitlin, you interviewed the chairman of the Democratic Party yesterday, and you asked him about voter turnout. Let's play some of his response. No, I, I think that we're probably going to be on line with what happened in 2016, which was still a significant record turnout uh, would be uh, at the 2008 level. Uh, 2008 was just a magical uh, experience. Uh, uh, there was actually just a few days be uh, between uh, Iowa and New Hampshire. It was only five days instead of eight days. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there was this mad rush. Obama had won uh, Iowa and then Hillary fought back. Uh, and so the, the historic nature of both Hillary's candidacy and Obama's candidacy, uh, the, the, the huge election that we had in 2006 where, you know, Democrats swept everything. And so there's this amazing energy that was out there. So uh, to be able to uh, duplicate that would be really, really difficult. All right, Caitlin. So uh, are you seeing what the chairman described? You know, I'm curious about that question because when we were leading into Iowa, lots of people told us there on the ground that they were expecting record turnout, and that didn't happen. And this comes, of course, after we saw a high turnout in those 2018 midterms, and Democrats thought that uh, they would have high turnout coming into these primaries and caucuses uh, because there is such this passion among Democrats right now about finding a candidate who can defeat Donald Trump. So you heard from the chairman of the Democratic Party here in New Hampshire trying to kind of lower those expectations. And I asked him why. In a year that Democrats seem so animated uh, this time around, why they might not expect record turnout. And he said, look, there are so many candidates still running for the Democratic Party nomination that a lot of folks in the party just want someone else to figure it out. Pick a nominee and they say we'll show up in November. Uh, but I think if there isn't really high turnout here uh, and if we don't start to see it in some of these other primary and caucus contests coming up down the pike, I think that does raise questions about just how enthusiastic Democrats are at this point. I want to ask you about Joe Biden because he was on CTM yesterday and he kind of appeared to be like downgrading expectations. Perhaps it's no surprise yeah. considering the turn, you know, how things turned out for him in Iowa wasn't um, what he had hoped. I think he called it a gut punch. Um, and so now New Hampshire is not looking the same for him. I mean, how crucial is New Hampshire for the Biden campaign? Well, really on day one of campaigning here after Iowa, the former vice president said that he took a gut punch in the Hawkeye state and he's expected to take a hit in the Granite state. And that was a real lowering of expectations uh, for him, which was pretty remarkable considering that he's been campaigning on electability. Now, his campaign has always argued that they're not going to do as well in New Hampshire and Iowa as they will expect to do in South Carolina or Nevada, states that have much more diverse electorates and where they feel they can really make Make their case and Democrats have argued that you have to have a broad coalition in order to actually gain the nomination but uh, if he does have a poor showing here if he doesn't uh, come in second place you know maybe if he comes in fourth and if he comes behind Amy Klobuchar or Elizabeth Warren I think that does raise a lot of questions about that electability pitch because he's been campaigning as someone who can convert uh, Trump supporters get back those voters who voted for Obama before and then convert to Trump in 2016. He's really been making that pitch in Iowa and New Hampshire. Uh, but if those results don't come in uh, in this primary process, that does raise a lot of questions about whether he can get to that final place he wants to get, which is to have a good showing in South Carolina. Yeah, and Caitlin, I'm not a politics reporter, uh, but if you are supposedly the front runner, then you should actually be winning. And the question that I have, I guess, is with the South Carolina primary happening on the 29th of February, if you don't do well here, the question to me, the first thing I think mm -hmm. about is cash. Do you have enough cash on hand? Yeah. Even if South Carolina right. is supposed to be your firewall, as the former vice president says, do you have enough cash on hand to pay 
the campaign, the folks who are working for you to get to the end of the month, number mm -hmm. one. And number two, is it troubling right. that, for example, uh, Michael Bloomberg, who doesn't appear on the ballot in New Hampshire, is actually gaining and gaining traction specifically with African Americans, even though... To, to Biden's loss. To Biden's loss, At least even with though one poll. he had some serious issues with yeah. African Americans here in New York City. Right. And actually, Michael Bloomberg uh, won some votes last night, even though he's not on the ballot here in New Hampshire in that famous Dixville Notch uh, primary where you can vote at midnight uh, starting today. Uh, those voters, uh, three of the five of them, chose Michael Bloomberg, wrote his name in there. Uh, but look, you know, there are a lot of criticisms from Democrats about Iowa and New Hampshire going first. But we can say that these two states are momentum makers, even though they don't have a ton of delegates to offer the eventual nominee. They can help the nominee, uh, the, the, the candidate raise a lot of money, gain that momentum, get those headlines, get out of their support. And so if you're not, you know, placing in the top in these two states, it really does, uh, I think, hamper your ability to raise money and to make your case moving forward. Uh, we've seen that the Biden campaign has been focused all along on those states, but you're right to mention that others in this race, Michael Bloomberg, who is uh, considering or is trying to compete in those Super Tuesday states, has a lot of money. He has endless sums of money. He's up on air every uh, he's campaigning uh, across the country in those battlegrounds and really getting a lot of t attention from Donald Trump, who was here in Manchester just last night trying to rally the troops. So uh, there are these questions for Biden moving forward. And I think what we've seen in the rise of someone like Amy Klobuchar here in New Hampshire and from Pete Buttigieg, those are two candidates who are competing for those Biden voters, who are trying to get those voters who may have been inclined to the former vice president to uh, maybe take a second look at another candidate. And we've seen them having some successes, at least so far. All right, Caitlin, thank you very much.